Uh, we'll go ahead and get started uh, for our uh, board, Thursday board meeting. And uh, welcome, and we'll do introductions in the room here. Uh, first, uh, uh, Pat Malone, uh, Commissioner. Joe Kirby, Benton County Administrator. Vance Crony, County Council. Lillian Neville, Public Information Officer. What I heard. Okay. Anna Bell, how have you met with Commissioner? Uh, Brian Damers, United. Assuming of public health. Lisa Farley, Board of Commissioners. Erica Milo, Board Reporter. Greg Redler, Sheriff's Office. And, uh, looks like uh, Mayor Traber, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. This is Bip Traver, just here to listen. Okay, well, welcome. Uh, if that's everybody, we will uh, go ahead and get started uh, on the agenda uh, 2.1 uh, uh, discussion of the EOC and uh, some policy direction. So it looks like uh, that would be uh, Danielle and Danielle Brown, Brian Lee. Who, who wants to take the lead? Brian, do you want to go ahead and start? Uh, sure, sure. I'll just give a quick update. Uh, so, back in the EOC, we're uh, implementing additional safety precautions, additional wipe downs every hour, and a bunch of other measures to make sure people are adequately social distancing and making sure people don't get sick. Um, we don't. I don't have any specific policy direction uh, questions at this time. But just general updates, we did some tours uh, with some of the elected here of the EOC. Yep. Um, just talked about different functions and all those things to go over quite well. Um, we're moving along pretty, pretty steadily. There's a little bit of, um, I'm going to say, uh, burnout up to some degree happening in some of the sections. So we're looking ahead here in the next few weeks of what our operations are going to transition to and look like and what, we're, uh, what efforts we're supporting. The rapid response phase is sort of winding down, and we're we got a lot of plans in place and a lot of stuff ready to go if we need it. So we're just going to work on uh, finalizing those plans and be up there ready and start looking towards. I, I don't want to say full recovery because we, there's still a lot of a lot of questions about what this is going to do over the next few weeks. But we are going to start considering what recovery is going to look like. Um. Uh, great. Uh, Danielle, did you want to add to that? I did. Um, the health branch of the EOC is still going strong. We're um, continuing to finalize plans for alternate care site planning, um, finalize the behavioral health response plan, um, hotel motel sheltering. We're approaching uh, policy and, and discussion opportunities for that. We've gotten the cost. Um, figured out, so we'll be bringing that forward. Um, we have started yesterday developing a plan for mass sheltering in case there is another natural disaster um, that corresponds and we need to have a so, uh, place for folks to shelter um, secondary to a fly fire or something like that. So we're starting those plans this week. Um, we did find out yesterday, thanks to Vance, that we don't need an RFP for the alternate care site plan. Um, so we'll hopefully be moving that forward and are much, much closer to that being done. Um, um, Charlie sent me an email and asked me to give a couple of updates specific to testing and communicable disease. Um, so I'm just going to read those rather than try to paraphrase. Paraphrase. The OSU's Flash Willamette Valley Technology COVID Testing Collaboration is completed. Willamette Valley Technology anticipates their first tests on Thursday. 
when fully operational, the lab will be processing hundreds of COVID-19 tests each day and significantly boost local and statewide capacity. There is a lung report around this that I'm happy to share with you guys um, the link if you would like. Um, the increased testing capacity is critical. Most labs are now coming to us in a couple of days, but a few explicitly continue to take much longer. Um, the communicable disease team is conducting intensive contact notification and tracing on all positive cases we receive and on fit county contacts. We are notified from other cases in other county states. Some of our recent cases have been more complex and have involved complex cross jurisdictional coordination. Fortunately, these systems are well developed in Oregon and our sister counties are working as hard as we and information exchange is excellent. Uh, while Benton County capacity is adequate for the caseload we are currently experiencing, we look forward to learning details about a possible centralized OHA facilitated statewide contact tracing structure to augment local health departments as proposed yesterday by Governor Brown. We have been approached by the medical residency program at Car Comp Northwest and others <coughs> who may who may be available to assist with contact tracing locally or statewide and are awaiting mechanisms to utilize them, particularly how OHA envisions management of PHI. So those are the updates from Charlie that he asked me to share. Uh, great. I, I was glad to hear uh, that uh, um, OSU is um, with their facilities and, and expertise getting into the uh, uh, being able to test. Uh, I couldn't uh, quite hear you, Danielle, how many, uh, I was on a call yesterday, I guess, with uh, Good Sam, and they they talked about that, and it was something about six or seven hundred each weekend, and I didn't quite uh, mm -hmm. understand uh, how the weekend uh, um, fit in with that other than, I guess, uh, running seven days a week instead of um, five. So don't, don't quote me, uh, but as I understand, OSU will be reaching out to community members to do testing on the uh, right on Saturday, Sunday, when folks are going to be home to do the testing um, in their natural home environment rather than expecting folks to come to a lab. So it's really around the when people are available to do the test and trying to manage um, access to those. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. And the the goal was uh, something around 650 per weekend. Is that uh, a reasonable number? That's the number I have heard. Also, okay. is between six and seven hundred a weekend. Great. And uh, the, the advantage to that is it will, uh, it sounds like it'll be uh, concentrated in, in Benton County in the local area, so we, we should uh, get a much clearer picture of, of our uh, situation here. It, uh, do I have that correct? That is correct, yes. So these are folks that may be asymptomatic. Um, that are just quote unquote civilians that are tested. Great. Uh, uh, any questions for uh, Danielle or Brian? Uh, Zan? Uh, with respect to that new uh, capacity to go into and run the LA toxicology, um, if they are going to open up the testing much more broadly, um, it, will there still be some uh, doctors um, uh, referral needed, or uh, is it going to be uh, broad? Anyone can um, come to that? As I understand, there will not be a doctor's referral, but I'm not I'm not positive about that. Sounds like Mayor Traber might, um, or looks like Mayor Traber might have an answer. Uh, Biff? Yeah, I just wanted to add part of what I heard. So Sorry about stepping in, but it was uh, yesterday on the OSU briefing and some things I had read uh, earlier that there are actually two activities going on on testing with the Willamette Valley uh, uh, Toxicology Labs, I guess is the name. One is the normal clinical kind of testing uh, that had been worked out with the vet labs and I think that is the kind of thing when you're at a medical practitioner and 
and they decide they're going to uh, do a swab or whatever and do the testing. Then there's also an epidemiological study that the uh, School of Public Health has been pushing along using the same testing facility and that's what's occurring on the weekends is to try and do a sampling out to the community to see the prevalence in the community, not those that have come in with symptoms and gone to a medical practitioner. And so I think those, it, what I was hearing yesterday at the OSU briefing was there were two, right. two yeah. activities going along that were using the same thing. So I hope that helps. Uh, That's very helpful. I, if that clears up um, some of what I was puzzled about. <clears throat> And I uh, believe the testing is going to uh, start this weekend. Is that correct? Great. So uh, I know I've been following that for two or three weeks, and, and uh, I'm glad to see it uh, being implemented this quickly. Okay. Uh, anything else for uh, Brian or Danielle? Uh, Commissioner Malone, one of the things we were going to ask Brian to brief you on this morning was the grant that's being requested and that will be on your uh, board meeting next Tuesday. Brian, do you want to elaborate on that at this point? Yes, um, I'll do my best. It was kind of weird how that came to be. There's so many uh, weird random fun things popping up. Uh, but that one was from the Bureau of Justice Administration at the federal level. Um, it, the, basically, it's a grant geared towards law enforcement and corrections for PPE, medical supplies, training, etc. specifically geared towards COVID-19. Um, so I believe Benton County is allotted $58,000, and we just wanted to basically apply for that to be eligible to get additional funds for PPE. The grant is a two-year cycle, so starting from January 20th on, anything we purchase for law enforcement, as far as I understand, uh, is reimbursable under that grant. So completely separate from FEMA, and it's pretty cut and dry on what, what it's geared towards. And uh, so, Brian, you'll, you'll be giving us more information next week on, on that uh, process? Correct, yes. Uh, I'm going to have to get more information on it, right. even it's been a mystery. I, I, the state didn't actually even know about it. I, I got it from a roundabout way. So um, we're investigating more about it uh, and every detail about it other than what it's geared towards. But we're going to look more into the process of it, and I can brief you in further detail next week. Great. That, that, uh, I really appreciate you being creative yeah. and looking for funding streams. We're uh, a little later in the meeting, we'll talk about the money that we're spending, but uh, it, it's nice to uh, have some sources to uh, backfill what uh, some of the outgo that we're uh, expending. So, yeah. so, uh, so thank you and keep up the good work. Anything else for uh, Brian? Uh, hearing none, we will uh, go to 2.2 vulnerable population and migrant uh, workers? Uh, Pat, Pat, I have a question for Brian real quick. This is David Bell. Uh, Brian, I didn't get in on the tours yesterday. Can I come sometime today? Uh, yes, I believe Teresa has you scheduled for 3 p.m. All right, thank you. Yes, no problem. Okay. Uh, uh, vulnerable populations and migrant uh, workers. So, uh, Rocio Munoz, do uh, you want to uh, join us here? Hi, good morning, Commissioners. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to Danielle. Uh, I'm really excited to share information and, and excited to hear your questions as well. Um, so, the vulnerable population section under the Public Health Division launched uh, about two weeks ago. And we've been working uh, diligently to uh, reach or to connect and to connect with communities who are hard to reach. And so we know that our rural communities um, have lots of barriers um, and, and it, it's very diverse. And so uh, we are working with our Joint Information Center 
have they developed some sort of coast card um, to reach our older adults who are who are living at home in the rural areas where they um, are isolated or are trying to stay at home um, just to get them more information because we know that they may or may not be on social media um, and, and, and or even online so getting a little bit more information and I think the context of that and, and that postcard is still being developed um, the the joint information center is just amazing um, and have a lot on their plate, but surely working very closely with them. Um, the other thing that we're working on is uh, the region's food banks. So um, we're working with supporting agencies as they navigate new food safety procedures for repackaging foods. And so one of the things that we were able to, to that just sparked was a new collaboration um, with our very own Benton County Dialog Bus to deliver food boxes to people, including uh, our rural areas, so we're making sure, uh, well, we're actually expanding the current model that the Fidelis School District is doing uh, with some of the families to deliver foods and other items. And so it, it's really just piggybacking on their, it's just the, the, that specific model, but working with our region's food banks to deliver to our, our uh, rural residents. So that includes South Benton, Alcee, Philoma, Squadget, and North and South Fidelis Food Banks. Uh, we're also ensuring that we're connecting our rural uh, um, individuals uh, if they come to those food banks with other um, needs that they may have. So we're connecting them to our health navigation uh, team in the Monroe and the Alpe Clinic. And then finally, um, just a big uh, the chunk of this section really is that our outreach to farms, including farm workers. And also, um, who have they've been identified as essential workforce during this pandemic, um, and just all the outreach that we're doing for our overall Spanish-speaking Latino community in our county. So there, there was a recent article you may have uh, come across this already in the Oregonian, and also data that was just recently released from the Oregon Health Authority uh, that indicates that Latinos uh, are are being disproportionately impacted by COVID. So I personally come from a farm working um, seasonal, uh, excuse me, a seasonal farm working household, and I greatly understand the challenges and barriers that low income and underserved community goes through, and even more so today. So for this, um, our amazing and talented Ana Luz Torres, our health navigator uh, at the health center, has been working to connect the farm with the over with the end the intention of reaching our farm workers. Um, we know that the lack of health care has been one of the biggest challenges um, in, in this pandemic and just overall information. Um, and so Ana Luz has been calling, has called about 70 farms um, to essentially get information about how we can, we as public health, to support their efforts to support their, their workforce. And so uh, we've invited ourselves to come out and uh, talk to the workers. Uh, we haven't actually got a, a specific ask to, to come out, but we have been providing them with information that they can pass on to their workers. Many of them are actually um, either closed for the season. Uh, others have just a few leads that are working. Uh, some of them are just are also just, uh, uh, family members. And so um, we did hear from a couple of farms that they're even considering canceling the entire harvest. And one of them specifically had 60 workers lined up for the season and is considering not hiring them um, because, of, because of this. And so um, others have welcomed us with this pandemic. When the pandemic slows down, they want to come back, come to their farm and talk to their workers. Um, and we're also collaborating with the um, Oregon Farm Bureau to get uh, information out to our 240 farms that we have in, in Benton County and get information in there uh, with our website and with our phone bank information in English and Spanish. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we're doing. Um, we also um, just finally, um, we're getting more and more questions about the stimulus checks and the barriers that many people have in accessing them, either lack of uh, technology, uh, knowing how to navigate that system, or because they're not eligible. And so many many of our former working families uh, will not be eligible for the federal stimulus. They may are, are they uh, may not even be eligible for unemployment right now. And so uh, many people are getting paid off. Many of them are actually scared of being unemployed more so than even contracting COVID. 
just because of the uh, insecurity that comes with that, the, the ripple effect that it has on housing and food insecurity. So there's some um, local efforts to create an emergency fund and be able to support some of these individuals that are going through that. Um, Let me know if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, Roseanne? Um, I know that, uh, thank you, Lucio, and um, thank you uh, to your whole team um, doing great work. I um, was on a call the other day um, and learned about um, an effort that's uh, being led by a fellow named Anthony Vidis out of uh, Salem, uh, and he has put together basically an Oregon um, Latinx virtual town hall trying to get together all of the nonprofits across the state that are working on these issues. Have you been able to plug into that effort? No, I have not, and I would appreciate any fault if you have a link or you have information, that would be great. Yeah, I will I will connect you directly with, with Anthony. And um, and I know that the other thing that's going on uh, in support of what they're working on is the Oregon Relief, Worker Relief Fund, which is, um, they're already fundraising through CALSA, but um, they uh, are also trying to get the state legislature to funds to cover these folks that aren't eligible for any of the checks or any of the unemployment. And um, so um, that's something that I'm hoping to talk to our legislators about as well. Um, so that, that's I great. There's too much pressure on the state budget, but this, this, is, this is important. California actually just passed that. Uh, yes, I saw that. And so, it's just, uh, okay. I mean, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm aware of, of that um, effort just uh, so I'm tracking it, so we can't, personally as an employee, I can't advocate for or against, but I can certainly track it and mm -hmm. then if it does become live, then I would definitely be able to make any more mm -hmm. connections to come after that. But I appreciate mm -hmm. your support and that you're aware of that and that you would be following up with that. It would be very important for our families. Thank you, Rochelle, thank, thank you very much. Well, make sure you take care of yourself. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Rocio, uh, you mentioned the food banks and, and uh, some uh, food box deliveries by dial -a bus Is that, uh, uh, has that program already started? Those conversations have been happening now for, I think, a week, maybe a little bit more. Um, so I believe that Mac Gillespie uh, he's, uh, he's actually the one that's spearheading a bi-weekly uh, phone call with food service providers. Mm -hmm. And so I would need to connect with him to see if it's already up and running. From my understanding is that it's still in the planning stages right now, uh, but it's going to be easy to pick up because it's already a model that exists, that the style bus is already doing this for the Corral School District. They have a lot of children who need things delivered. And so I think it's gonna be something, it's just a matter of planning the week there's five days in the week uh, over the work, the work week, and so I that in there's six food banks that I under, that I understand are, are um, needing the service, and so we want to make sure and prioritize our role, <coughs> our role for food bankers. Well, uh, great, because it, it's my understanding Dial Bus has some uh, spare capacity uh, for uh, over the work. obvious <laughs> reasons, and, and I really like uh, uh, the flexibility of uh, figuring out who. Uh, who has what resources and making those kind of connections. So uh, very glad to hear about that and I hope the food banks are uh, holding up all right. I've, I've heard that there's uh, quite a bit of uh, pressure on them and uh, a lot of their traditional uh, suppliers aren't uh, aren't coming through, and, and so they're, uh, they're scrambling, but uh, nothing more uh, essential than uh, getting uh, food to the people that, that need it. So uh, thank you for the update on that. Suppliers uh, aren't. Uh, any other questions for Rosie? Uh, they're scrambling, but. Rosie, I'm in for a final question. Um, it was very essential, concerning uh, to hear that farmers may consider canceling harvest on so many fronts. Um, obviously, the direct impact to the farm workers, but then also 
the ripple effect. Um, you know, really, the, the tragic loss of a, of a commodity as well. Um, one of the topics that we're taking up later today and that I've been working with State Force and her team on economic recovery is um, sort of a short-term bridge loan program that, that helps businesses get um, through the coming, well, through the current weeks and the coming weeks before CARES dollars begin to flow and are accessible. And I was just curious whether you have any insights into whether farms are in need of kind of smaller dollar bridge loans to help businesses to kind of stem the tide for 30 or 60 days uh, just as more conventional small businesses are in need. And I was just curious whether we are in, uh, when we're reaching out to farmers, we are mentioning the information that our um, Corvallis and County Economic Development efforts have. Uh, so we're making those connections along with their field extension. Uh, they have a small farms program, so we have been collaborating with them. And uh, actually, Catherine Duval was uh, uh, to just provide any follow up support to the farmers. Um, I have, from what I, what we've been hearing, it's more around the uh, fear of bringing people together um, and uh, not and needing to abide by the governor's uh, social or physical distancing uh, guidelines. And so some of them are even considering doing a UTIC uh, kind of uh, season rather than having farm workers sit and have them available just so that there's less contact with not with um, with, uh, fruits and vegetables. So um, I know that the reach out that we're doing, we're making sure that we're connected to these efforts uh, around kind of for small or for businesses. But that's to the extent that I, I know. And the other thing is with the food bank, I know that NAPA left people so working with other uh, collaborative people that are, um, I know that farmers people that are farming for the food bank. So just trying to keep the economy sustainable, at least for some of our farmers here, and that way the farms, the food banks are purchasing, or the limited to food share are purchasing from the local farmers, um, rather than the people that are farming for the Any other uh, questions for Rocio? Sustainable, at least for some of our farmers. If not, uh, thank you very much for your report and, and uh, some important work and it's nice to uh, get an update on that so uh, looks like next up is a review, a review of the EOC financials um, Mary Otley done uh, personally uh, Don Dale and, and I think uh, we're, hopefully Brian is still with us if, if there's any questions for him so uh, Mary, do you want to uh, take the lead on that, or? Well, actually, uh, Debbie or Don have a much better understanding of this because these are their spreadsheets, and so um, I don't see that Don's on, so I guess Debbie. Yeah, I am on. Oh, oh you're, you don't, there's no DD, Don. Well, I'm on my cell phone, so. Okay, so go for it. Uh, and so, Don, yeah. Don, okay. and, Don and Debbie. So this is Don. Oh. Hey, Don, Joe Kirby, let me just interject real quick for the commissioners. Uh, commissioners, the information that Don and Debbie will be reviewing uh, is in your email as of uh, probably around 5 o'clock last night. So you have a couple of spreadsheets out there. If you haven't had the chance to look at them, I would encourage you to pull them up. Thanks, Don. Go for it. Yeah. You want me to go ahead, or do you want me to give everybody a few minutes to pull it up? Uh, well, why don't you go uh, go ahead and introduce, introduce the talk? Uh, I've got one ex uh, Excel spreadsheet, and then there's uh, a another one. So maybe if you could let us know which one you're. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's easier to look at if you pull up the Excel spreadsheet. Okay. Because um, the PDF is actually the same thing, but the Excel spreadsheet uh, seemed to be easier when I discussed it before to kind of look at it. Okay. 
Okay, so we've broken out the Excel spreadsheet. There's several tabs, and so what I've done um, on the very first tab, it says total cost. And so the total cost is kind of to give you guys an overview of some things that I thought were important. And so just to let you know that these costs are as of a last, end of last operational period. I also was able to incorporate um, some actuals from payroll, because remember, we're doing this sheet. Um, this is actually estimated uh, cost. And so we're estimating payroll, but we also, as payroll is posting, are then comparing it to the estimates um, to adjust. And so we had a big payroll that hit on Wednesday, so I was able to go out and look at what was posted in the actual to kind of true that up. And so I'll talk about that on this beginning worksheet. So the very total cost at the very top, you will see that we've broken it out into other entities, Benton County and City of Corvallis. And so you can kind of see um, right there the snapshot as of 410, we were looking at 815,000, um, and then you can see how it's broke out between. And so other entities, the only thing we're capturing in other entities is um, payroll cost of people who are in the EOC. So we're able to take the sign-in sheet and see who is not county or city. And so we have like, um, sometimes we'll have somebody from Good Sam, sometimes we'll have, uh, we have people from the school district, those kind of folks. And so we're reaching out to their payroll people and finding out what their benefit and wage costs are, and so we're kind of calculating that. So that by no means has any kind of materials or services or any kind of cost, but we wanted to be able to capture some of the costs that were coming into the EOC. So if you go down on that spreadsheet, you'll see in red where I have EOC cost only and then outside EOC cost. And so I also, again, have broken it out into the different entities. And so um, one thing I want to note um, with the personnel cost is that um, this spreadsheet is kind of trying to capture for you guys so you can see everything that is related to COVID. It doesn't necessarily mean that everything on this worksheet is going to be reimbursable through the grant. So one of the examples is personnel, folks that it's just straight time and it's not overtime, that is not covered by the grant. So on that spreadsheet, you'll see towards the bottom, I have in red where I say total OT salary and benefits for the county. So as of the actual payroll posting um, for salary and benefits, even though the county as of 331, um, when that's posted, you'll see total COVID wages benefits right above that 17,000 of 259,000. Um, all, not all of that is going to be reimbursable. Actually, only $17,449.80 of that at 75% would be reimbursable through the grant. So we have a lot of personnel time that's being devoted to this COVID event that is not necessarily going to be reimbursable. So I just want to make note of that. Um, also on that spreadsheet in the very uh, first tab, the total cost, um, I kind of did a truing up of the payroll cost of the payroll that posted on 415, which was through payroll through 331. And so, um, you know, our estimates are only as good as the people who are turning in their 214, which we are monitoring and letting folks know that if they posted to um, the payroll lines in COVID-19, if we don't have a 214, um, we have the tax folks um, in uh, finance who are actually reaching out and saying, hey, we need 214. But that and also people who are not coding their time in ESS on a timely basis, which we are finding that, you know, people are not putting it in until payroll is due. We have asked and reminded folks to be putting that into ESS um, the same day we have a two-day lag that we're pulling the numbers from, but if people aren't putting that in timely, our estimates are only as good as those who are putting it in. So where you see where I have down, where it's a difference between estimated and actual, the $48,941.98, that difference is because folks are not doing what we need them to do. The good news is that we can then, when actuals are posted, we can then true that up so that we can give you guys a better estimated cost. So 
Um, so that's the first tab. So before I go on to the other tab, does anybody have any questions about this first tab? Um, I, I, I was there this morning when uh, the timesheets <clears throat> were uh, mentioned as um, an important part of the operation and, and um, it, it sounded like there were a few sl slow learners in the group but uh, in order to for us to track and at some point uh, get some of this reimbursed the the record keeping has to be uh, uh, as good as we can and, and we need everybody's uh, cooperation on that so I appreciate you, know, you folks emphasizing that and I hope the cooperation uh, uh, get gets even better than it is uh, currently. I yeah, the unfortunate thing. Go ahead, Don. Go ahead. So the yeah, the unfortunate thing is is that you know we have to keep reminding folks because as we um, have evolving people in all of the departments. Um, that's where it's getting dropped because we have to continue to remind them, hey, you're supposed to do this. So I don't know that that's ever going to be a perfect process, just to give you that heads up. Sure. Yeah. I just have a follow up question, and that is about the overtime piece. And how, do, how does that work with respect to non reps um, that, that are putting in uh, really long hours like yourself? Yeah, so I, so unfortunately, those folks were not paying out overtime for. And so that, um, you know, maybe in some grants a match could be with that, but there's nothing documented in there that we're able to sit there and use any of that as being reimbursable because we're not paying it out. There, okay. the, there's a sheet, um, and if you need me to send you a copy that really explains that piece with the labor where it's talking about if it's a benefited position that we've already budgeted for, and that's where the key is, if we have already budgeted for it, it's not reimbursable. And so the fact that you have um, exempt people who, even though they're working overtime, there's not, there's not additional money paid out and they actually are already budgeted for it, that's not reimbursable. Yeah, that's a really challenging question because uh, as I'm aware, some of the people that are working hardest are fall into that category and it's, um, it's tough. Yeah. And I, just, I would like to also know paint a positive side to this that says we've got a lot of employees who are doing this before teams daily, which is a completely foreign concept to pretty much everybody in the county. So I am so appreciative of all of the employees who are doing their time daily and doing those 214s on a regular basis and able to give us relatively decent numbers on on a daily basis for us to get cost estimates. Well, I appreciate how much work it's been for the two of you. It was really nice to I think that we are going to be way ahead of the game in terms of having the data and the fact that you can do some of that um, triangulation now rather than waiting until after everything's um, been done is a, a real advantage. Um, but have to take care of yourselves too. To Don and Debbie, a question for you regarding the uh, benefits. Could you explain to the commissioners what percentage you're using for uh, to calculate benefits and why? Um, I'll let Debbie take that one. So on the cost estimates that we do on a daily basis, I have loaded it with a 35% rate for benefits. Um, part of that is where you see some of the difference possibly, um, depending on what size of benefits people have. Um, so that, that's the percentage that I use, just the 35%. Debbie, do you want to take review committee so 
so we stay consistent with that. That, that makes sense. Yeah, and just know that, I mean, that, that is only necessary just to do the estimates so that um, you guys aren't having to wait till actual payroll posts. But know that when actual payroll posts, where there's some that could be higher or lower, we are then capturing that in our spreadsheets when the actual payroll posts. Okay. And, and the plan is uh, the spreadsheet that, that you... Uh, sent around yesterday is through last Friday, is that correct? Correct, yeah, because it's sort of like because we're waiting for folks to get their time in or 214 to be submitted, having a two-day lag um, helps us to be able to get the data in. So my promise to Joe Kirby was that we would submit, um, Debbie and I would submit on every Wednesday and make sure that we had all the costs up until the last operational period, which ends on a Friday. Right. Um, that way we can get you the most accurate information. And you will see there were a few things put in from this week that we kind of threw in there. And I, I actually wanted to give you guys what the actual payroll was, so I kind of had put that in there. So you may see a few things straggling from the next week, but know that we have all the costs in there as of the last operational, the last day of the last operational period. Okay. Well, uh, I, I can see, uh, especially that this is the first of the weekly reporting that uh, might maybe a little fine tuning on the uh, spreadsheet to uh, uh, tighten things up a little bit. But uh, I look forward to the uh, w weekly report so we have some notion how much we're I investing in this uh, operation. Correct, and we've been actually doing the spreadsheet since it started the uh, first day. So um, you, this is the first one you guys are getting, but we have been submitting them um, to Joe uh, for the last couple of weeks. So, um, but yes, it is evolving, you know, as each um, operation or period happens and we're able to put more data in. So um, I do want to go over just the other tabs real quick, if you guys are ready to, to move on. Sure. Just a quick question. Um, will you also include in future reports of, of, of graph trends? It would be kind of interesting to see how the um, staffing component and the materials and supplies component um, changes over over time um, and as we progress to this incident. Yeah, and we can do that because um, on the next tab, you'll see where we actually have it each operational period and what the costs are. So we can easily include a graph in, um, in another tab on here so that you guys can see that in a, a graph type form. So that's an easy to do. Thank you. Yeah, so I, with numbers, visual really helps me. Yeah, I'm a visual person too, so I get it. <laughs> okay, what, what, why don't you go down um, the, the other tabs? Okay, so then the next tabs are actually the more detail where you guys can actually see what is happening and where these expenditures are going. So the next tab is the county tab. And so you will see that um, on the left hand side, we actually have by each date the items um, that are getting paid for and so you can kind of see um, the stuff that mm. is happening in the EOC you can see where we're adding the personnel costs um, you can see actually where some of the expenditures um, and kind of what they are some of the bigger items you can kind of flow through there and then on the other side of the highlights on the left hand side we kind of have broken down um, so that you guys can see totals of like so we've broken out where we've got the payroll costs and then um, the other two where it's a, like an orange, that's where we're kind of truing it up because we're actually matching actual payroll. We're also matching, we have a project accounting set up for this and so we're actually matching those things that are hitting that project accounting. So not only are we capturing what's happening in the EOC, um, there's also things that are also going to this project that are happening in the different departments. Um, unfortunately, some of that we're not going to see till invoices start hitting if we're not being told that things are happening. 
but this is our mechanism for kind of capturing that. But you guys can see where we have like lunches and snacks in the OC, um, just supplies. There's been some publication of forms. There's been some equipment purchase. There's contracts, health and safety. Um, and then, like I said, then um, there's also where things that are not in the uh, EOC that are happening. And so there's um, by each operational period, and then if you go down at the very bottom, you'll be able to see where we've totaled all of those lines. So just um, looking at the spreadsheet I gave you, just to give an example, the EOC lunch and snacks so far, we've spent $6,792.50. Um, so we kind of have that in there for you also. I also think it's interesting, um, there's a difference in the county and city personnel when you're looking at it, that the county actually is um, devoting more personnel resources to outside the EOC than we are in the EOC. I think that has a lot to do with probably the health department, it's just my guess. Um, Debbie's looking at some of that more detail so she might be able to say more about that. Um, whereas the city actually has and I think they have more costly people in the city um, working in the EOC than outside. So that's a difference in the city and county and that kind of is um, obvious on that first page, um, the total cost cap. Um, now, as you guys are looking at this, if there is more detail that you want than Debbie and I are putting on here, you know, like I said, this is ever evolving, just let us know. Um, so does anybody have any questions on the county cap? Um, no, it's very useful. It's very detailed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I'll go to the city tab. So the city actually does their stuff a little bit different than us. Um, I also will say that at this point, their payroll is only estimated because they only pay on the 15th once a month, and they do not have ESS. So I'm hoping, um, I was told probably around the 20th, we'd be able to get actuals for them. So on their payroll cost, um, we'll have to true that up. They also have not been contributing to any of the costs in the EOC. That has pretty much been on the county. There was just the first day where they um, did thermometers and then they were told that they weren't allowed to um, put anything on their P card to do with the EOC. That all fell on the county. Um, so then you'll see also that there are five tabs. So we are able to pull their project accounting detail. Um, and so they have it um, in categories, but I also have their spreadsheet that may give some more details <coughs> if you guys are interested in it. But at this point, we've just been putting the categories um, that they've been putting. And so all of those, their materials and service expenditures are actually things that they're doing outside of the EOC. Um, and are putting to their project. Uh, Don, can you clarify? Don, can you clarify the yeah. hundred and two thousand? I think that applies to computers. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it does. So, okay. yeah. So that hundred and two thousand happened to be um, computers that they um, purchased. Um, when I asked them about that, um, the comment was that they don't use laptops, and so they ordered, uh, I don't know if it was like 50 of them um, that they ordered, and so they would not have ordered them had it not been for the COVID event, and so that's why they put it in their project. Now, the thing is, they can put whatever they want in their project to track it. It doesn't necessarily mean that those items are going to be reimbursable through the grant. So. Just keep that in mind, even though they put it on here. If it doesn't meet that criteria, it, it's not going to be reimbursable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's the city tab. Um, the other entities, like I said, that is only tracking the um, payroll cost of outside entities that are sitting in the EOC. Um, we have not gotten any information uh, from other entities um, that has flowed through us to be able to add anything more than that on the spreadsheet. And then the last tab is um, a tab where, so we have the, if, if we have any items that go over the 3,000 
or if we've gone over 10,000 in a day, the, we have made note of what days that has happened and, um, and what those items entail. So just so you guys can kind of see uh, what has been happening in the EOC and, and when those amounts have gone over. <clears throat> Any uh, more questions for Don? Roseanne? Just one, one last question. Um, so it looks like there were a couple of days where the expenses did go over, and I know that the way that the uh, agreement was written between the city and the county, there had to be a uh, uh, certain level of permissions when they do go over authority. What's the process then for that? Okay, so what we did is at the sheriff's office, we actually have a PO process um, because we have to do that for items over a thousand dollars so it just seemed um, like since we already had a process in the sheriff's office and since the sheriff and under sheriff are the ones that um, are the ones with the authority to sign off on these we use that same process so we have a PO <coughs> form that we kind of fill out that has to do with that and then um, I help facilitate that with the sheriff or under sheriff and have them sign off on that and so then we're also documenting that in the PO system in units, so that if we ever have to go back and look at that, we have all those documents and they're in a permanent place. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? Um, if Given that this is a public health emergency and if some of the expenditures were really more health related rather than um, law enforcement, public safety related, uh, would, can you ever envision a process where you would need to come to county for general fund dollars instead of uh, sheriff's office uh, for uh, funding authority for something? Uh, do you want me to answer that, or Mary, do you want to? I, I was going to, we, what we've done, Commissioner, is we've uh, set up a, a cost center that really has no budget in it just to track this, and it's in the general fund, so it's being funded by the general fund to no particular department at this time. Okay, uh, that, so it's the, the sheriff and other sheriff are just, um, they're the gatekeepers at this point, but it's not allocated. Thank you. It's not, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not their budget or it's, it's in our non-departmental budget at this point. Uh, Commissioner Osro, also to let you know that if there's a significant expenditure that exceeds the thresholds that have been provided, uh, that you're aware of the 3,000 and the 10,000, if there's something that exceeds the 10,000, uh, the sheriff typically calls me and just gives me a heads up as a professional courtesy. And so uh, uh, there is... Uh, uh, another layer to that process uh, that the sheriff is voluntarily including me uh, in that when there are uh, th when we exceed the threshold of the ten thousand. Thank you. Also, I would and like one to. One more: the personnel costs are being charged to the department. It's not, it's not mm -hmm. being charged to the So this is just the materials and services and other costs. Commissioners, if you could also go back to the first tab where it says total cost. Uh, I just wanted to highlight something. Uh, Don mentioned that the uh, city uh, since early on uh, has not been responsible for any of the EFC expenses. Um, I would highlight that early on the city uh, was and they continue to provide substantial uh, support to the EOC regarding personnel. And uh, initially, uh, they were providing greater support from a personnel perspective than we were uh, in the EOC. Uh, I think that equilibrium is uh, being achieved now where the county has been dedicated, uh, been dedicating more resources over the last couple of weeks to the EOC. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that the, the city certainly has been contributing personnel support to the EOC. All right, uh, 
Well, obviously the um, financial component of the EOC is critical and, and really appreciate your efforts, Mary and uh, Debbie and Don. And I assume we'll be talking with you uh, next Thursday, if, if not before. All right. Uh, Thank you. Uh, next up, 2.4, uh, Dev North, Northwest, uh, Kate Portia, who has joined us and um, has a, a proposal that we um, briefly talked about uh, at our last meeting on, on Tuesday. And uh, uh, Kate sent out a, a two and a half page uh, proposal that she's going to talk to us about now. Uh, welcome, Kate. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, fitting me into your agenda on such short notice. I really appreciate it. So, yes, I sent out a proposal, and maybe before we start going through that, I did want to make sure you guys were all up to date on the news that's just emerged this morning that both the Paycheck Protection Program and the SBA emergency uh, loan um, have reached their funding threshold. And so sadly right now, if businesses go to the SBA website, um, they see a message that says that there is a lapse in appropriations, which I think is um, a technical way of saying they've run out of money. Um, right before this, I was on the phone call with um, our regional uh, solutions team and Representative Kurt Schrader was on. Uh, he, of course, is aware of this, and I know that they are talking about a reallocation for these programs in the next COVID bill, and that's being discussed uh, next week at the federal level. But I, I will say, and you can probably hear it in my voice and see it on my face, that this was um, just, I was, it was the first thing I saw this morning, and I was really taken aback. I, um, I knew that the funds were finite, but I didn't dream that it would run out so quickly because what it's feeling like to us as practitioners is that we are maybe um, a quarter of the way, maybe a third of the way with getting businesses connected with these federal resources. Um, so I wanted to lay that as a framework. Um, it may shift some of this discussion today and how you guys want to respond but, uh, by way of background with the latest news. Okay, so let me take you through this. I sent through a, a memo, and really I just wanted to kind of review the proposed um, uh, structure for the loan program and let you know that by way of background, in preparing this, uh, we had multiple phone calls with our partners at Dev Northwest to talk to them about this. But I also reached out to uh, Seth City of Albany and um, Austin Ramirez, who runs economic development for Lane County. And those are the two communities in our region who have launched programs similar to this. And I basically wanted to take their brains offline and understand what worked, what didn't, what would they change, that sort of thing before we rolled out ours. All of us, I feel really lucky, I think I've shared with you, we've got a great working relationship with our regional partners. Um, and they were very candid in sharing, sharing their information. So. Um, many of the changes I think that Lane County would have liked to have seen um, were incorporated by Albany and Deaf Northwest. I think they were sort of learning as, as they went. Uh, the program that we've proposed here for you today that we can still talk through is, um, is a very similar match in many ways to, to what Albany has put up as well. So let me walk you through this. Um, the proposal here would be $100,000 coming from um, the county's uh, economic development funds from the deal lottery. And Dev Northwest has agreed to match that with a $50,000 contribution. Uh, those funds are coming down from the Oregon uh, Community Foundation to them. And so they're able to, you know, they're wanting to leverage those funds as well, just as you guys are. So that's very good fit there. So that would make the total capitalization of this fund $150,000. Um, what we're proposing, and this is one of the items I'd like to discuss with you all a little bit later, but what we're proposing is loan amounts between $5,000 and $10,000. Uh, now, at a capitalization of $150,000, that means uh, 15 to 30 loans would be approved through this process. 
The structure um, that they use both in Lane County and in the city of Albany is where businesses uh, don't have any payments uh, or interest accruing for the first six months. And that's a structure that business citizens responded very favorably to. Then at the six month mark, they begin to accrue interest at the low 2% rate. Uh, and then at the 12 month mark, they begin to make principal and interest payments for the remaining 48 months on that amortization period to pay the funds back. Of course, they can pay them sooner. Uh, I think the notion in Albany when there were the PPP and idle loan funds was that uh, there may be some businesses who are able to pay those loans back when they receive their federal funds. That's you know one possibility, but if not, they would have up to five years total for this loan program. Um, Denmark West has developed a really straightforward, simple application. Uh, our plan would be to have this application available both in English and in Spanish. Um, I also wanted to point out when we last talked, the program that Lane County did, if, if you guys may recall, was Lane County and the city partners, they actually passed money through to uh, Community Lending Works slash Death Northwest, same entity. Uh, they passed that money through as a grant to Death Northwest so that should businesses um, uh, default on that loan, um, the Death Northwest would not be responsible for paying that money back. Um, they switched that setup in Albany and what we're proposing here for you is that it would actually be a loan program <clears throat> and that if um, if businesses are able to pay that principal act, that principal amount would come back to Benton County to replenish your funds. However, the agreement that they structured with Albany and what's being proposed here is that if a business fails, um, Dev Northwest would write off that loan and the county would also agree to write off that portion with Dev Northwest. That is, the county the county couldn't hold Dev Northwest liable for businesses that ended up failing, but you would benefit and get principal back from those who are able to pay it. Okay. Um, the way that they're making up for um, not retaining the principal in terms of making this work on the administrative side for them is they are charging a 4% administration fee up front, and that's how Dev Northwest plans to cover their costs for this work, and basically in terms of the administration. So we, um, we proposed that the loan funds be distributed through a lottery system. I think we chatted about this briefly. This is one significant change uh, that was made between Lane County and then the City of Albany's program. Everybody I'm talking to really likes this system. And so the notion is that you open up the program, you advertise the heck out of it for a certain amount of time, um, give folks the opportunity to apply, and then there's a lottery system of applicants um, to be eligible for this fund. We strongly believe that this is a more equitable distribution of funds as compared to a first come first serve basis, which is what Lane County's uh, program originally looked like. We think that is uh, not advantageous to minorities or people who have businesses and perhaps English as their first language, things like that. So we're really fond of, of, of the lottery structure. Um, we are Proposing, and this is another topic again for discussion that we'll I'll get down to here for you guys. Um, we're proposing that we do uh, what I think Dev Northwest called a soft set aside, but basically a 30% set aside of funds would be reserved for minority businesses or rural businesses. So those businesses outside specifically of the city limits of Fort Dallas. And basically what that does is um, the way Dev Northwest does that is so as they are receiving the application, if the applicant is either outside the city limits, um, but in Benton County, or they are a minority business, then they are eligible and go into a lottery just for that pot of the, the 30%. Everybody else goes into that larger lottery. Now, in that first round, if we don't have um, as many applicants, I just say, you know, if we have more funding than applicants on the minority rural side, and there's extra money there, Dev Northwest then has rolled that money to the general pot and made it available for the other applicants who can apply. But, but basically the minority and rural get first crack at that 30% uh, set aside. Um, while I'm talking about the city limits, I didn't put this in the memo because it's a bit of a nuance, but one thing that we did discuss 
we want it to be really clear. Of course, Benton County, we're so special um, because you guys also get a portion of the city of Albany, right? And I, I wouldn't want to forget about them. Um, I do want to say the thought that we have is that we would like to keep the boundary as Benton County, we think that makes sense, but we would like to exclude those businesses from within the city of Albany limits because they've already had a funding opportunity available to them. And so we we felt like that was sort of a double dip. And in fact, they may have some other funds coming online here in the near future through their CDBG dollars. So we'd like to do sort of an exclusion of North Albany, City of Albany uh, businesses, if that makes sense. And of course, there aren't a ton of businesses in that area anyway. Um, to be eligible for the loan, businesses would have to have their headquarters in Benton County. We are proposing that they have 20 or fewer employees. We'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that. And um, they have to be in good financial standing before the executive order related to COVID came out. Um, so I included in the memo at the bottom kind of their, the underwriting process that Dev Northwest has used, how they basically do the review. The financial review is basically to make sure that the businesses were profitable uh, 2019 and through year to date 2020. The notion here is these funds are not to support businesses who are already struggling going into this. This is to help businesses who are strong um, prior to uh, this emergency coming up. Um, in addition, they, um, there's something else that I wanted to mention on that. Um, yeah, they have to show that they are from an industry impacted by coronavirus or social distancing. Of course, that's, that's not hard to do, but, but they need to make that, um, that nexus as well. Um, the other thing they need to provide, and this is, this does not have to be complicated, this is to be a wonder, but they do need to provide an emergency plan. Um, and this is basically how they, their business plans to respond to the emergency. Um, their plans to apply for, either in the future federal money or, um, um, or if they've received federal money and how they plan to do that. So it's not meant to be a burdensome task, but really just to illustrate that they are thinking about their emergency plan and to show that they've got a, a path forward, if you will, as a business. So I want to pause there and back it up. Really, the, the three questions that I was hoping to get some feedback from you all were related to uh, the amount of the loan. We had a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue on this. Um, I think in my perfect world, I said it on a phone call, I would set structure this where we could provide the least amount of money that would be still be helpful to businesses, but that could benefit the most amount of businesses in Benton County. Um, I will tell you the five to ten thousand dollar level was a level that our partners at the SBDC, who I really trust, they're the ones that are really on the front lines of our businesses, they felt like this was a good dollar amount. But I also recognize that we're talking about five to uh, 15 to 30 businesses that we could affect with that dollar amount. Um, I will say too, um, Nick, I don't know if Nick is on, oh yeah, I can see, I see his initials. Uh, Nick and I had some email exchanges yesterday too, um, about <coughs> grant funds. Um, you know, with grant funds and a smaller dollar amount, that might be a way that you could help folks, really just with, say, you know, about a dollar, you know, basically one, one month uh, lease payment. Um, I think the problem, like, I'm actually, I'm not opposed to the idea of grants, but I had heard you all previously say that you were, you were really hoping for more of a loan structure where you could recoup some of these funds, which is understandable. I will say on the loan fund, Dev Northwest, um, I think would really, I, I don't think they're interested in administering loans smaller than $5,000, um, only because the time, you know, I think we've talked about this before, and I know Mary's on the call, the time to administer a $2,500 loan over five years is the same amount of time to administer a $25 million loan, right? And so it just makes it um, really challenging for them on the administrative side. The loan amounts we'd like to talk to you about, the set aside, the 30% for minority rural wanted to check in, see how that feels, if it's the right number. Again, that's the number that we put in as a proposal. 
and um, also how long to, to keep the program open and advertise it. I think we're leaning toward a 10-day window to, um, to keep that open for folks. Uh, Lynn, Lane County only did like three days, uh, which was not a lot of time to get the word out. Albany, I think, was closer to five. There's pros and cons. The longer we leave it open, I think the better chance we have of reaching minority-owned businesses yep. to be completely transparent, right, and to create better equity. However, we're going to get more and more people applying, which means you may have more folks disappointed um, because we're only going to have a limit. So those are really the three main topics that I was hoping to discuss with you all and to get feedback on today, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have as well. Um, Sam? Um, I guess my first question is about the 20 employee threshold. Um, without a, a local um, business license, we don't really have demographics for any of our businesses, and, as I, I understand it. And so, do we have any sense for what kind of businesses in Benton County have fewer than 20 employees versus those that are more? And I know that this would exclude a lot of, say, restaurants that have uh, lots of part-time employees, um, how part-time factored in. Just curious. Yes, and I, and I apologize, I reached out to Patrick O'Connor to see if he could get that breakdown for us before this call, and I have not received a reply back, so I don't know the answer to that. I think he will have that breakdown. I'd ask him for a breakdown of just what you're saying, kind of businesses, uh, number of businesses by FTE, I do know um, that when Albany was creating theirs, I mean, I'm looking for this document, um, they, I think the reason, I will say, let me, let me say this, uh, Lane County limited theirs to 20 FTE. Albany did theirs at 40 FTE. Um, there were some um, businesses and groups that they wanted to include. Um, Dev Northwest flexible with what we want to do. I think the notion of keeping it under 40, there was a stat in here that I was looking for about basically when we look at Oregon as a whole, I don't think Albany or Lane, I don't know that they look locally, but Oregon as a whole is a very small business heavy state, right? Uh, 40, 20 or fewer businesses. So we know that that's a good sweet spot, but 40 is certainly allowable. And I will say, um, I'm not trying to pick favorites here, but I, in my mind, when I think about policy, I'm always trying to run some examples through. And there are, as you're saying, Van, some, um, you know, some restaurant businesses, some, some core retail that I think we all think of as part of our community that I don't know would qualify at the 20 FTE list. That's really my core question. Uh, you know, uh, you and they may be some of the more viable businesses. I don't know. If, uh, that, so that's the only thing that troubles me. Everything else in terms of the approach, um, I really like. Uh, but this question has been nagging at me. Um, and us as well. And it's certainly one, what I would tell you, and I know we have more policy edits to discuss and that others have thoughts. Um, again, I think Dev Northwest is looking for a verbal commitment this week from you guys. And there is still the possibility to hammer out a couple of these details and we could try to uh, get our hands on some data that could, could better inform that decision for you guys. Um, so I, I do feel like if there's general agreement on the spirit of moving ahead with something that we could take that, get the process started and still uh, bring back a, a couple of these, these minor details for you. Yeah. I remain supportive of the overall concept and, and the framework. So. Um, I would be comfortable with that. Uh, it's not to me. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I just sat down and uh, it sounds good to me. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> one of the questions was the 70-30, uh, 70% uh, 70 general uh, and 30% a reserve for uh, rural and minority uh, businesses. Uh, before I read the details, I was thinking one third, two thirds, because that fits the uh, population of 
uh, two thirds of the county being uh, Corvallis area, one third outside. So it, it uh, is basically in that uh, uh, framework. So I, I, I think that's a good uh, uh, split to, to do on that. Uh, you mentioned uh, how long to keep the window open. I, I would have that in the same category as uh, the number FTE, whether the magic number is 20 or 25. Uh, you, you can, I think, uh, fine tune that, get a little more information and, and uh, get, get back to us, uh, I think. But uh, uh, I appreciate the, the work and, and uh, uh, Lane County and Albany uh, going ahead and um, uh, leaving us with a pretty good road roadmap to to follow. So uh, I, I think I'm I'm in favor of the concept. One uh, thing that you mentioned Tuesday and briefly mentioned today was uh, this this may be the first round and uh, see how it, how it goes and uh, see if there's other uh, funding sources we can uh, access for, for round two. But uh, I think it's important to get this started. And uh, uh, would it be appropriate, Joe, to have a motion to uh, uh, proceed uh, uh, to, to give uh, Deaf North, Northwest a, a sense of the the board at this point so they can um, uh, get their uh, uh, part lined up? Uh, I think that, Kate, I'm going to ask you what your insight is here. Uh, ultimately, there's going to be an agreement signed uh, between the county and Dev Northwest, I assume. And my assumption is, is that contract will come back to this board. Uh, so the board, if if the direction that Kate you've received this morning is enough for you, I think the formalization of the contract uh, is is where things are uh, finalized. But if you feel like you need a, a motion from the board supporting the concept this morning, uh, I'm a little cautious about that because I think there's still some details that are going to be worked out. Um, but Kate, what's your preference? I think, honestly, actually, I feel like what we've got here is sufficient. Again, Deb Northwest Institute is looking for a verbal commitment, and I have verbally heard three commissioners say that they support the concept with the notion that we iron out a couple of these details. So I'm comfortable with that. And I know uh, Vance is on the call also. I will say I think the contract should be pretty easy because, again, our friends in Albany were very gracious in sharing everything they have. So I already have the contract that Albany executed with Deb Northwest. Um, so I'm hopeful that perhaps this is even just a find and replace Denton County for City of Albany, uh, and of course a, a, a legal review to make sure you're comfortable with it, that it, it, this won't be a protracted negotiation. I think it'll be quite easy for you. Kate, I do, do have two questions before the board finalizes their discussion with you, and that relates to the uh, administrative fee and the interest rate. Uh, I'm a little bit confused yeah. still as to Dev Northwest's role versus Community Lending Works' role. Is it strictly going to be Dev Northwest and Community Lending Works is not involved? Correct, it will be. And it's because Dev Northwest is Community Lending Works in our area. And I apologize for the confusion with the nomenclature. Down in Lane County, they are Community Lending Works. And here, for our area, they are Dev Northwest. So all agreements will be with Dev Northwest. They are the same entity. Um, and again, the 4% fee is an upfront administration mm -hmm. fee that they will charge to, to administer the loan over the five year period for the payback. And then the borrowers themselves will pay the 2% interest beginning at that six month mark after the date of the note. Okay, great. Thanks for clarifying that. And then lastly, commissioners, I want to touch base with Mary Otley uh, regarding our video lottery. Uh, fund and how much money is currently in there. I know we've talked about this several weeks ago, but Mary, can you remind us what the fund balance currently is for that and what you see happening uh, with the uh, future revenue or video lottery revenues? Uh, 
And then, Mary, uh, another question for you. As it relates to our CDBG fund, uh, refresh our memories regarding the, what the fund balance is there and what uh, money has been committed uh, most recently as part of our utility district assessments. Right. We have about $323,000 in the fund right now, and we committed 150000 And I don't know where that is with Public Works for the... The survey of the service district, so that left 170 70 thousand dollars available uh, for whatever. Uh, Kate, also point of clarification, we've talked a little bit about how the city would be, or if they would be contributing to the same uh, program, uh, based on conversations that you and Mary and I have had. My understanding is that the city's position was if we were using video lottery dollars that they didn't plan to participate uh, financially because those are revenues that come to the county for economic development purposes. Uh, however, my understanding was once we ended up, if we started to target CDBG funds, uh, there was uh, maybe more of a dialogue that could be occurring with the city relative to partnering uh, with them on a contribution uh, to this. So can you please speak to that? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you for asking. Um, so to clarify, it, my understanding is the, the city's contribution isn't related so much to which funding source you guys use. It's more related to the city's access to funds that they could use for this purpose, right? Um, at this point in time, um, I'm continuing to have conversations with Mark and with um, Paul Vallada, his Greenwich is the CDG fund, to be if there is going to be the control to um, to utilize some of those funds. The problem is we don't have the the new the new extra kind of CDBG funds that are coming down. We have not yet received, and as I understood it, even from yesterday, they're still waiting on some rulemaking as to what those new CDBG funds can be used for. The allocations for our existing CDBG funds are already committed, um, so we'd be relying on that new fund. So I did let Mark know that I you know, that I heard loud and clear from the county that there is great interest, and there's interest on my part as well that the city participate in some manner, um, but that there was a level of comfort with the county understanding that the city doesn't have those funds right now, but that perhaps in a, a second round, at least that's what I recall hearing from our last meeting, uh, that the city participate either through the CDBG fund or the city council has um, their council discretionary funds um, be a possibility as well. Um, so I continue to really beat that drum with the city as a high, high priority. Does that help, Joe? Thank you. Well, a gate, uh, I, I really uh, appreciate the effort uh, uh, getting this uh, proposal to us. And uh, I, I like that it's, uh, I think, strikes a nice balance. Um, I think I talked to you after she wrote me and said that. Hey, hey um, folks, whoever is talking, please yeah. mute your microphone. I don't know, like, she was up for answers, but then she had to one time, I believe her the lawyer before she mailed them up. Sounds like it's close. Is that Debbie Forsyth? Uh, Debbie looks like yeah, she's mute. Uh, and anyway, uh, a nice balance between uh, keeping things relatively simple, but uh, having some uh, qualifications to uh, 
to get through so that we're helping viable uh, businesses. So, uh, Thank you. I appreciate that. Any, any other uh, questions for Kate, uh, Zan? Actually, I had a question for you, but I think Mary is on the phone. So, uh, I'm just saying, if the contract is going to be related question, but it's not directly for Kate, it's actually about the fact that we talked about some potential for a small pot of money for nonprofits to help them. Commissioner Mullen, I think we need to so, interject. So whoever's on the phone, will you please mute, mute your mic? Uh, Mary? Yeah, not me. Not you. Uh, huh? Okay, so Debbie Parsons. Uh, whoever's board office. I see the mic is not muted. It's not me. I don't have my phone on, and I just unmuted myself on my computer, so it's not me. Sorry, Debbie. We were definitely pointing the finger in your direction. <laughs> uh -huh. I think on my screen it shows the initials of B O as the unmuted mic. Well, I, I think that's our uh, device. Is that right? It's a phone call. Fair enough. I'll bring back the. She might be thinking of FHWA or, you know. Yeah. Uh, Teresa? Teresa? Yeah. It is not me. All right. We're going down the list. Hey Nick, are you able to mute? Okay, uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Joe, did you have anything else we need no, to go? Good, thank you. So I think uh, we will uh, adjourn this meeting and uh, appreciate your efforts, Kate, and uh, keep us posted and meeting adjourned. And we'll uh, thank you.